Parched earth, prairie grass, and no respite in sight. Concrete pillars now visible where the water line once stood level. Short rains and intense storms have battered the American Southwest. Dropping water levels, drought spanning many years. This is the face of climate change in Texas, Mexico, and much of the Southwest United States at this time. Like the receding water levels here at the Falcon Reservoir, Dr. Alex Rasilis says that this has left much of the region reeling. Think of it like any kind of slush fund, right? I mean, you, you keep, uh, you know, $100 uh, in your closet just for an emergency days, and every once in a while you take off a few bucks here and there, here and there, and then all of a sudden you're down to 10, 10 bucks, and you realize, oh my gosh, we need more. Once it reaches a certain point, we are in extreme drought, and often at that time, some of the users will implement drought saving strategies. They become increasingly harder to predict. And so the strategy then is to try and prepare for the unpredictable. Try to reduce the dependency on an, another external force to bring you what you need and just try to prepare and increase uh, your self-reliance on your own property. The drought has come at a high cost for Tyler Raska and his father. Spanning two years, the future is looking bleak. We were praying for rain every day, you know, every time they said that we might get some rain chance coming down. I mean, we were all hoping for rain, but at the end, but then when the uh, rain would come through, we didn't get much. I mean, we might get a tenth or so, and kind of made you upset, but you can't do nothing about it. The money from the insurance just helps you not go broke. I mean, you don't make no money. With the insurance money, you can't even pay the loan back, but normally the bankers will work with you till next year. I mean, it just keeps you from going broke is all it really does. I mean, you don't make a profit. With wells drying up, Dr. Juan Enciso at Texas A&M University uses his family background and knowledge to look for reliable solutions to prevent America's breadbasket from turning into a dust bowl. My father was an agricultural engineer in Michoacan, and they talk about irrigation and, and, and research in water, how to conserve water. And it was very interesting to me, and I said, that's what I want to do. I want to design irrigation pumps uh, to irrigate the crops. I want to see how can I use less water for the crops. It was fascinating to me. The main crop was avocados. So a lot of people were growing avocados and they wanted to produce more. So they were irrigating, and by doing that, they were, they were affecting the hydrology of that area. They were depleting the aquifers. Uh, by using more water, they were drying some rivers. So I, I thought that that was very important to study how to use less water, how to manage our irrigation more efficiently. This experience from his childhood made him examine how to use water efficiently when crops need it to reduce overall waste. Most of the crops they need, uh, like citrus, they require eight to 10 irrigations. Uh, vegetables, they re require four, five irrigations. So we have to reduce the number of irrigations. Uh, we can uh, irrigate in critical stages of the crops so we don't affect our yields that much. For example, if, if we have corn, 
the critical periods of corn are the flowering and the grain filling stage. So we can target those stages and we, we reduce the number of irrigation, so we don't irrigate four or five times, so we irrigate two or three times in those critical periods of the crop. His search for ways to combat the times did not stop there. Next, Enciso began looking at the region's infrastructure. We have to uh, change canals for underground pipes. Polypipe is a plastic flexible pipe. They irrigate the crops. So I, I think they have uh, been a lot of progress. Farmers are being more efficient, but we have to be even more efficient every year. This drought and others spanning the continent has also come at a cost for local wildlife. Monarch butterflies that traverse the United States and Mexico seasonally, pollinating crops are facing extinction as the foliage they rely on go up in smoke and dust. We've gone from a population, you know, of over a million into now, you know, over a hundred thousand in the last 30 years. So that's significant declines. A few years back, there were, you know, hundreds documented overwintering, which is a big change, right? You go from hundreds of thousands at these overwintering sites to a few hundred. Monarchs are a pollinator, and they do well when other pollinators do well. And our food depends on pollinators. Unfortunately for American farmers, these conditions and declining insect populations are not just limited to the Southwest. As butterfly and bee populations decline, so do farming profits and available food. Across the country, beekeepers are looking to slow this decline. This is uh, Maryland's largest community garden bee yard and it is also Baltimore City's largest bee yard. My name is Charles DeBarber. I am the beekeeper here at Filbert Street Garden. Uh, I manage over 20 hives. Basically, I'm feeding my smoker here. We have been smoking bees for thousands of years now. The trick isn't to try to calm the bees down with smoke, it's to try to keep them calm the entire time because they start in a state of calm and we don't want to rustle them up. I like to put a tiny bit of smoke right down in here. Right now they're storing as much honey as possible and right now they're drawing on this. Yeah, let me bring this around. They're back filling everything with nectar inside of there. Bees pollinate a third of the crops that feed the world. In the U.S. alone, the work of bees pollinating crops is valued at $15 billion a year. But their populations are collapsing, killed off by pesticides and the loss of their natural habitat. Honeybees themselves make mass agriculture possible. It's stunning the amount of things that honeybees and native pollinators pollinate uh, that we consume. Each hive that we have pollinates a two mile radius around the hive for honeybees. In addition to that, a lot of the grazing animals that we eat in our meat supply is dependent on plants that are pollinated by honeybees and other native pollinators. The attrition rate's still insane. When I was a boy, it was maybe you'd lose one out of every 20 hives. If you do everything right, you could lose a quarter to a third of your hives like each year. That's some sobering numbers. Oh, there she is. That's Her Majesty right there. She's a beautiful one, look at that. But if there's a great lesson to learn from these bees is just tenacity. They will literally work themselves to death to build a better home for them and their progeny. That's what they do. They, the typical worker only lives about six weeks because they will literally work themselves to death for it. They'll give everything they need for the next generation even though they're not going to live to see it. I love honeybees because they are a clockwork creature. Everything about there is very predictable. 
and no matter what's going on in my life, I can come down here and I can pop open a hive and I can hear that in unison boom and smell the wax and the honey and it's so, so calming. It's probably the most peaceful I ever get.